I am unashamed. What about you? So welcome back to uh, Unashamed. Jace, while you were in uh, Missy were going to the to movie last night, which we talked about in the last podcast, Lisa and I were doing a little, kind of a little mini event, I guess you would call it, down here in, uh, in South Alabama. Um, we call it the other L.A., Lower Alabama. Um, that's kind of our home away from home. But, you know, we you're always trying to kind of fit into your community. And so we went to a fundraiser last year for the pregnancy center that's here. And, you know, Lisa and I speak at pregnancy center fundraisers all around the country. It's pretty much what we do other than this podcast, you know, to make our living. But when we went to the one here, we just went as contributors and just, you know, for our community and hear about it. And so we told them that we would be glad to speak at this year's event, which we're going to do. And so last night they had a meeting of their table host and, you know, it's just a great community outreach to try to give women an answer. Cause you know, Alabama's like Louisiana abortion now is against the law. And so you got a lot of women that are pregnant. And so you got to have somebody willing to help them. And that's what this organization does. And so it was pretty cool to go in and, meet with these folks and tell them, look, we live here now part-time. And so we're a part of the community. And so it was kind of a setup, but I found out last night that Willie is going to be down here uh, in a couple of weeks and speaking at a sportsman's kind of like a sportsman's night out, they call it in Pensacola. And so I was going to ask your opinion. So my friend, a friend of mine that was with us last night, he and his wife, they want to go to this event they want us to go. And I thought, should I just go and pay and go to an event that one of my brothers is speaking at and feel good about it? Or should I, (laughs) I mean, it it feels weird if I just bought tickets and went, should I do it or not do it? I mean, my friend wants to go. And so I kind of want to go just so he'll hear Willie. But then I was thinking, should I let Willie know I'm coming? Cause you know, you know how it is when you're doing an event, I don't like a bunch of extra stuff to have to deal with. So I was like, it's kind of got me in a pickle. I mean, I don't know that I, I should try to big time it or just slide in. I've and had, or what. I, I've had a lot of family members, not not any of my brothers, but like approach me when I was in an area saying, "Hey, you know, I'm you're here, close to me. I'm, I'm here. What <laughs> what does that look like? It, it's a hard thing to navigate because you know immediately you default to, well, I have an assistant. Well go through the system but i just can't see myself trying to work my way back to see willie in the green room it just would i don't know I'm, maybe it's just my pride people get a false impression of how that works because i mean i'm kind of burying my soul here but usually i have no idea where i'm even going until i'm walking out the door so like me trying to organize us meeting some I don't I don't know where I'm going. So I'm giving you the person who has put this together because if you're relying right. on me getting you through that door, which you gotta remember too, you know, there's breakdowns on that. I have been to multiple events that I was gonna speak at and I couldn't get through the door because the security people that they had hired did not give a picture of the person who was supposed to speak, which would be me. And so when I come pulling up there, they're like, Hey, where do you think you're going? I was like, well, I'm, I look at the whole, I look at the (laughs) whole system that we have found ourselves in. And one of the things, as you've noted, that I don't even stick so much as a fingernail into someone who's been trained as a son preach the word and yep. and and actually all four of y'all on the on the male side y'all are in my mind that's a that's a a job that can't be replaced or added to it's it just is what it is so it's pretty impressive. Well, it's, it's pretty impressive. It, it's a it's a humble opportunity. I guess what I was asking for and Jace got it right off the bat is we do this all the time. And so like, I know Willie's got to get in. I already know he's, he's on his way to another event. And so I'm thinking, I don't want to add to whatever else he's going to have going on. Yeah. If you reach out, you're getting the eye roll. There's two setbacks. You got to, if you're willing to do this, 
you got to realize that when he hears or reads your text, there will be an immediate eye roll. Oh, well, now <laughs> I got to fool with that. But Al, Al now wants to horn in on my. Yeah, and the second thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, there's always a friend. There's always a buddy. There's always a friend. Yeah. And then yeah. the second thing is, you will then be a butt of many jokes in That's his right. presentation, because because he won't exactly be able right. to resist. If you're up speaking and he sees you, he will have to tell a a joke where you get thrown under the bus. That will happen. But See, if you, I, I'm you viewing it, it where that be Jep, Willie, Jace. You, Al, I view that, that while everyone will, 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 might marvel at four family members coming out of one little group, they marvel at what Jesus did. He said to his disciples, and this is a good lesson for modern day concerning all y'all's outreach efforts. Uh, Listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you, Jesus said. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men and that's 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 the message. That's the family message. Starting with me, handed down to you, Al, next to Jace, yep. then Willie, yep. then Jeff. They did not understand what this meant when he said, you better pay attention to what's fixed to happen here. It was hidden from them. I have a question going into that 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 Luke chapter nine. Why would you hide that at the period of time? They did not understand what it meant and it, that Jesus had to die, and it was hidden from them so that they did not grasp it, and they were afraid to ask him about it. I mean, you're saying you're going to die. What? What, what are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> yeah. And, the, and they didn't have <laughs> enough courage to walk up and say, Let's sit down here for a minute there, Master, and we just got a few questions here that, that, that we're not to touch this thing with a 10-foot pole, but we're scared of what you're saying. It, it, it's not, it's kept quiet as it could. He said, just, 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 just stay the course here. It'll unfold. You'll figure it out. But it was a while before they even figured it out. But what was the hidden part? Is it has to do with, with Satan? Not being briefed or, or how does that how well does that i think work? it had i think it has has probably more to do with the fact my, that i got four sons yeah i got four sons that are preaching this message right here right now so now it's time to you know get get, get on it but at the time well in this time frame it's interesting that you bring that up because last night since uh, since we were speaking to a group of people that are going to be present in about a month when we give our normal presentation. I told Lisa, I said, well, whatever we talk about tonight, we don't want to get into that because we're going to be talking about that next month. And so we didn't want to get into our story. And so we decided we would tell the story because it's a pro-life crowd, obviously. So we decided we'd tell Phyllis's story, you know, about her finding us and, you know, and, yep. and me able to t- tell her mom, you know, thank you for choosing life, because if she hadn't chosen life when she had every reason not to, to abort her, then we wouldn't have found our sister because she would already be in heaven. We wouldn't get to meet her. So we told that story and it was it was great. It was it was powerful. But it was funny, Dad, in the story, I said that mom had always said and she said this many times. So she was on record with her prediction that one day. She said a, a a man, a boy, a man was going to show up. It turned out to be a, a girl. But she said a guy's going to show up and say he's your daddy's son. It's going to happen one day. She made that prediction many times. And and then it happened 44 years later uh, because that period before you were a Christian, Dad, that the, a, a daughter did show up. And so mom had predicted that. And so what do you do with the prediction? Because, you know, obviously that's something that would wreck a lot of families. But in our case, it didn't. We embraced Phyllis, and so did Mom, because she was your daughter. And, and that didn't said, change the fact that, that, Yeah. She said to this day, she said, as a young daughter, not knowing, I mean, she didn't know who her dad was. Correct. She said, she said, I felt the power of God upon me 
Yep. When I was a young look, everybody was cutting up, carrying on, and more drugs. And nope, not her. She said, I was, nope. I, I just knew something was up. And she said, now I know she, what it was. But that's, uh, she always, wild. she always, she always sought out Christian community because they moved around yep. a lot. Whenever they would move yep. to a new place, she would seek out Christian community as a little girl on her own. Yep. And you're she said right. She was I mean, the her only, story. Yep. Yeah, she was, she said that was the only faithful one in the group, my, her family. Right group yep she was and and it was i it was obvious that god had his hand of providence on her throughout yep. her life as she fat she married a guy that wound up being a missionary and her with him and they they raised two boys together they've been married over 25 years all those things were like she was in our family the entire time had the same blessing that we had on us so it is a pretty amazing story uh that we by the way that we broke on the podcast uh you know, a few years ago, we found her. So I don't know, Jace, I was thinking about it, that mom making that bold prediction, and it turned out to be true, was kind of what Jesus was doing in our Luke 9 text, that he's making a bold prediction of what he came there to do. And of course, it was going to be true because he's the son of God. Yeah. So we're at a pivotal moment here. Well, what's Luke. the delay, Jace, on the implementation of this? What's I'll give you my two cents. I, I think it's two things. Because he does say it, what we're fixing to read it. He first predicts it in 9, 21 through 22. And then kind of the implications of that. Well, then you read the part where he predicted it in, where is that at? Verse 44. 43, yeah, 43. 43. And then he does it again uh, soon after this, the third time. Uh I don't know where it is off the top of my head here, but and then he also brings up the sign of Jonah, you know, in chapter 11, and, but he, he continues to predict it. So my two thoughts are one, we know from first Corinthians two, seven, which I know you're familiar with that, that none of the rulers at that time understood the implications of Jesus's death or they wouldn't, have crucified him. You know, Paul makes that point. This is uh, 2, 6, and 7 of 1 Corinthians. When Paul said, We speak a message of wisdom among the mature, not the wisdom of this age or the rulers who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom. Yep. A wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began, none of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, well, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. Plus, Jay. So, so yes. that's one. But that's one point. I want to give my second point because I think this is the more pressing point is the reason the disciples didn't understand it because you're seeing the signs of what they thought the kingdom should be. We referred to it on the last podcast when you read in chapter 9 and 51 through 55, after this transfiguration with Elijah, just to remind you what we talked about, they all of a sudden thought, well, fireballs are on the table. And so they're wanting to hurl down fireballs at anyone who disagrees. So the reason it was kept from them is because even when Peter, you remember when they came to arrest Jesus, what did he do? He grabbed a sword and cut his ear off. I think if they would have fully understood this, that Jesus was going to die. Yeah. Well, they would have led a revolt to stop it. Yep. And he was trying to explain to them, no, this is God's plan, which is what we're going to get into in 23, because he then says, not only am I going to die, you're going to have to die. And so the true meaning of that was hidden, because if you don't, they're going to rise up and try to revolt and they're all going to get slaughtered. And, probably Jesus is going to die anyway, but it wouldn't be in a way that he's saying the re he was trying to unveil the reason he was going to die and let it play out. Cause it would then point to the love of God for humanity instead of some revolt, like every other revolt that goes on that went dreadfully wrong and then try, try to say, Oh, well we only did this cause we love you, but that's not the way that the heart is not right then. Then you're, you're out of rage. 
you're attacking the party that's trying to attack Jesus. So, so that's my two points. And they couldn't hang, hang on, see Dad. Hang on, Dad. In hang the on, future, Dad. hang on, Dad. Let's take a break. So we're in the throes of summer in Louisiana, which means hot, humid, sweaty. If you're outside, it's just impossible. You know, you walk out and it's like you're underwater as soon as you go out. So your clothing matters. Um, Jay, you do a lot of outside activities. Yeah. Uh, what you wear matters. Sometimes you have to cover up because you got things trying to kind of get back at you. Uh, but one of the things people don't talk about a lot is their underwear. Um, because that matters too, uh, in this hot summertime, what happens to them? You don't want the bunch up. You know what I mean, Jay? It's the, the sweaty bunch. Well, when it's a hundred degrees and the humidity is 114, you need the most comfortable <laughs> pair of underwear. Yeah. There's an old saying, man. beware of the underwear. <laughs> There you go. I like that, Dad. Uh, so what we want to suggest is our friends at Tommy John who have breathable, lightweight, moisture-wicking fabric. And that's a big statement, moisture-wicking fabric, with four times the stretch of competing brands. So that's going to keep you cooler than cotton, and that's what we want. They've sold over 20 million pairs. People love them. They're not really uh, just customers. They're fanatics. And I've been using and wearing Tommy John's for years. Uh, so check these guys out. They have a best pair you'll ever wear, or it's free guarantee. So you can't go wrong by giving them a try. Get 20% off your first order right now at tommyjohn.com slash Phil. 20% off at tommyjohn.com slash Phil. See their site for details. Well, I'll just make the point. You, it'll look as he's recording it. Luke chapter 9, in answer to what you said, Jason, which is good good thinking. It's got chapter 9. They did not understand what it meant, verse 43, down at the bottom of the page here, what was meant. It was hidden from them so that they did not grasp, and they were were too, too afraid to ask him about it. Well, if you go to the next time that comes up is chapter 18, as we're moving forward here, Jesus took the 12 and told them, we're going to Jerusalem. It's the exact wordage. Everything that's written in the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. So he goes back in time, the big event. They've been predicting this. Jesus is coming. He's coming. Well, he'll be handed over to the Gentiles. They'll strike him, insult him, mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. He's making it worse than the first time. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. I just thought it worthy of note. That's the very thing what the disciples didn't understand at the time, Al. That's the very thing that moves this podcast forward via me, Jace right here, and you, wherever you are. You say... And all that now is something we are not to be ashamed of. When this first was announced, they didn't even know what he was talking about, what they would later not be ashamed to do. Is that cool or what? No, that's awesome. And, and in fact, he says that, Dad, in this section after, you know, he, Peter makes his confession, he says if anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the son of man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the father and of the holy angels. So to your point, that's exactly the way that's what we call this podcast because that's the way we live. I I, I wanted to make the Jace, you made a really interesting point about other rebellions. And when I was studying for this section, I discovered something I had never noticed before. And it, it came from, uh, Acts five of all places, whenever you remember when um, they were trying to figure out what to do in the early acts with Peter and John, the disciples. And so Gamal, who was a great Pharisee, a teacher of teachers, he's the one that trained Paul or Saul, you know, before he became Paul, he gives this speech because, you know, they're wanting to kill him. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. let's, we, you know, we've already been down this road. And he mentions a couple of rebellions in Acts chapter 5, 
uh, 34 through 37. And one of those rebellions was a guy named Judas the Galilean. And he mentioned, he said, back in the first census. Well, I never really had studied that or figured out who that person was until I was reading into this text. And it was it was fascinating to me because that rebellion occurred when Jesus would have been about 10 or 11 years old. And here's what I found fascinating about it. The this Judas, the Galilean, he had this uprising. So they went in and they stole a bunch of uh, a, a bunch of weapons from a Roman garrison. And the town that they stole it from was only four miles from Nazareth. So obviously it was right there close to Jesus hometown. But here's what's amazing. So not only was he, he was obviously killed, but not just that. They burned the city to the ground. They took all the inhabitants of the city and sold them into slavery because they didn't stop the uprising. Because, you know, the Romans, that was the one thing you didn't do was have an uprising, especially if you stole Roman stuff. Yeah. And then here's what's fascinating. And, and it really makes me think about Jesus thinking about his own death. He would have been 10 or 11. They crucified 2,000 rebels. This this guy, you know, Judas the Galilean Ooh. and his band. And they put them all along the road on the crosses, basically to dissuade anybody else from rebelling against the Roman Empire. But I thought about that. What what would that have been like for Jesus as a boy? And this is right before he went to the it's temple. A, the tough. only time we see him from his He's youth. on a very tough and, road. Oh, my goodness. He's yeah. looking at 2,000 crosses and and what that looks like. And people just out there probably rotting in the sun. And he knows that one day they're that's going to be what he's going to do. They're coming for me. All right. they, it's yeah. going to happen to me. I mean, I, I had never put those two together until I was studying for this context. And I that just put myself a, in the. But that well, might be a motivation for keeping this thing kind of quiet. Well, you, but, you, but because Jesus's way goes to the heart where God gives his life, which I, I feel like we need to read what he said, because this is not a rebellion. We're not going to take the kingdom by force, which is what everybody thought was fixed to happen. Even to this day, if it's all about the survival of the king and the kingdom, and you, you get there by trampling other, you, you kill them, any threat, you, you take them out, you crush them. And so, if that were to escalate, which it doesn't matter, it's really not. It's it's on the disciples. You know, they they didn't ask him about it. It's really on them. It was when it says it was kept hidden from them, but they were contributing to that by being fearful and not asking. You know, you should have asked him, and I think he would have tried to explain it more thoroughly. In that, look, I'm going to do this by giving myself. Now. We can argue about whether they could understand that, but kept hidden from them. I just don't think any rational thinking person would think that's the way to victory is to surrender and die. Well, who's gonna who's gonna believe that? It's hard to know. We we know what happened. They didn't know, and you're like, you're telling me you're gonna die, and that's how we win. <laughs> so don't fight. In the physical way, it's not that God didn't want you to fight, but the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. Well, you're never going to be able to pull at people's heartstrings by going and having a scrap on, on the bank, you know, and fighting and, and for you to pick a side and try to figure out what to do. And then we all wind up in debt or in prison. Where's the, where's the heart transformation in that? And, and it's interesting, Jace, because you're making Gamal's point that he was making in Acts chapter 5. Now, Jesus is already dead and gone. And he's saying, look, let's don't kill these guys. We have these other rebellions. They didn't come to anything. Let's wait and see what happens. So the jury in his mind was still out, even in Acts. Yeah. And he was saying, let's wait and see what happens, because if it's from God, we can't stop it anyway. I mean, that's the words he said. He said, right. but if it's not, then it'll play itself out. So even Gamal, as a wise Pharisee, even realized in that moment, if this thing is from God, we can't stop it. You can kill all any of the people you want to kill. And he wasn't outright condemning it either. He he left a little room for 
He wasn't quite right. sure Gamal did. He, he wasn't sure. That's exactly right, which is interesting. And that all happened after Jesus died. So I think to your point, Dad, I think Jace is right. There was enough doubt about what he was here for that he decided to leave it that way until he was ready to execute the plan for a no, lot of you, different reasons. You, you see it in our own society. I mean, when those terrorists came and bombed the buildings, you know, 9-11, you got to remember, we, we, we don't ever think like this, what I'm fixed to say. But they had a plan on how they were going to take over the world. Well, now that you look back on it, well, that didn't work. Not only did it not work, all those terrorists died. And yes, they killed some Americans. But guess what? Then we went over there and their cousins, their uncles, their people, you know, I mean, they got the full fury of this and it's what they don't realize is their propaganda was we're going to kill the infidel and take over the world well it it doesn't work that you know and that's why it just infuriates me when the world lumps all religion into that's what they're about no the jesus is his message and what he did was the exact opposite of that he came down here and he gave his life up and he stopped, whether it was veiling his disciples or, you know, grabbing Peter's sword or rebuking James and John about wanting to hurl fire, fireballs on the Samaritans. You know, he was like, no, no, no. That's why I brought up in Luke 12, which is a controversial verse in the overtime last time. But, you know, he then he, he rebuked them for wanting to send fireballs, but then he seems to encourage fire from heaven when when he said uh i'll read it again where was i at where i read hang that? on jace it's it, it's in oh, 12, 12. i'm in 12. chapter 11 yeah before you, 12 before you read that verse... before you read that let's take a break so one of my favorite guys uh on the planet he's uh, in ministry like us is a guy named jim daly he is the president of focus on the family and the focus on the family has meant a lot to our culture, and but it's meant a lot to my family because I can remember Lisa and I watching the old reel to reel James Dobson videos when we first got married, which has now been forty years ago. So these guys have been uh, out there in the thick of it, helping families uh, have a closer relationship with God. And Jim has a brand new podcast called Refocus. And uh, and I'm sure it'll be fantastic. I hadn't heard one yet, but I can't wait to listen. Dad and I are going to be on a, an episode coming up pretty soon, so we're excited about that. Jim's been the president at uh, Focus for about 20 years. Super guy, amazing story himself, and uh, and is a man who loves the Lord and is leading his family in the right way. Uh, they're going to talk to experts and guests. They're going to talk about uh, our culture. Uh, politics, um, family, everything that affects us every day. So check them out. Refocus with Jim Daly on Spotify, Apple, or anywhere else that you listen to podcasts. Refocus with Jim Daly. Luke twelve forty nine. I have come to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo and now... And how distressed I am until it is completed. But his point was, I think, and Al agrees with me, he was bringing judgment on himself. The judgment we deserve for our sins and the baptism he was referring to would be his death and you know his pain and his suffering and, and death. And the result of that would be the resurrection. It would be the Holy Spirit being poured out. But he was taking our sins. I mean, that's what's different about Jesus than every other religious leader or leader out there. He was not self-seeking and self-serving. We're not going to take this by force and we're going to keep this secret until it's revealed because the rulers, if they realize this is their ultimate destruction, well, they're not going to crucify me. (laughs) They wouldn't have done it. I mean, I don't think they would have ever figured it out, but in the spiritual world, you know, you talk about the devil and his angels This has been their method of destroying lives since the beginning of time. They'll kill you. I mean, Hebrews 2, 14 through 18 says that. They hold that power over people and the fear of death. 
and, and the evil one's a murderer from the beginning. He'll yeah. take you out. John the Baptist is a problem. What do they do? He uses wicked people and a breakdown of their family to get his head on a platter. They kill him. They stop that. And so someone else rises up. So it, they just, the Lord outwitted them by becoming a human and using their own destructive ideas, which is murder, to actually save the world and destroy their power. And what, I mean, what, what they incredible. thought was bad, the resurrection proved otherwise. It was all good. Jesus dying, him because it was a choice he made. It wasn't taken from him. It was a choice he made. He, he could have held down fireballs. And it gets back to love was the motivation. Because if you wouldn't have had that play out the way it did, you wouldn't be able to ask the question, well, why did, why did he do that? And so then you get to the true character of God, which is because he loved us. And so, I mean, it goes back to the first story that you told about, you know, speaking at these pregnancy centers and doing that event. You know, I'm on the other end of it, which is we encourage people to do the same thing. Well, what happens when someone says, yes, I'm going to have a baby and then difficulties come up? Part of what we have to do as followers of Jesus is then help them with, with a pregnancy that's going to be difficult because of their past or they don't have the resources or the means. And so that, that brings to life, Jace, yeah. while you're there. Since but, but I just wanted to finish my thought. Don't, so we help this baby and we help the mom. You say, well, why are you doing it? Because we love them. And it's, it's still that love, what he did on a cross trickles down to every part of society that makes it a better Correct. place is what my point. Go ahead, Phil. Since the children have flesh and blood, regarding death now, he too shared in their humanity. There's a reason. So that by his death, which is what he's talking about over in, in, in Luke, he might destroy him who holds the power of death and all the things you talked about that goes with him. That is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Exactly. That's so him. now I feel like we should read it because, look, we've been setting this up for two podcasts. So when he gets to Luke 9, and they asked him, who do you say I am? So we're in, in verse 20, and he said, you're the Christ, the Son of God or the Messiah, the chosen one. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone, which now you see why. That vein is in here. Yep. And he said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and he must be killed. And on the third day, be raised to life. I mean, it's just like bombshell. Now, you would think they would have focused on the be raised on the third day to life, but I'm pretty sure if you really put yourself in a situation and you never heard this and these are his friends and they think he's going to rain down fireballs on people, you know, th granted that hadn't happened yet, but he, they're thinking we're going to take it by force. When, when the words came out that the son of man must be killed, they probably didn't hear anything after that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, really? Not really. Now, if you say, yeah, I'm going to be raised three days later. Well, yeah, like spiritually speaking is probably what they're thinking. That, that's why they didn't understand it. Yeah. You're not going to be grasping the full nature of a bodily resurrection at this point of your life. Would you all agree? Yeah. It's yeah. not going to happen. So, so then he says, which this is the transition that we introduced last podcast, on what the implications of the act is. What what are the implications of you dying, being buried, and being raised? So then he says, if anyone would come after me, well, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So it's like, I'm going to show you the path. I mean, what's this bringing your cross? I mean, if you if you fast forward to what that means, and uh, you know, I've told my wife this a hundred times, and you know, when we've had difficult times or even arguments between us or whatever, 
you know, this verse comes up a lot because it's always the answer to every argument or situation. We as human beings and followers of Jesus, we are supposed to deny ourselves, take up our cross daily and follow Jesus. That is the answer to all situations That's that it. come up. What happens is that that verse has been read so many times. You know, you really have to put yourself carrying your cross. I mean, what was happening when Jesus was carrying his cross? People were persecuting him and hollering, but he's still, he's not getting off the, the plan. He He's still doing that. So when people do you wrong and people, you know, we have to get over bitterness or we have to repair a relationship or we try to repair other, you always got to remember what Jesus is asking us to do is to be walking in a mob, persecuting you and just it's a hail of abuse and insult that may be happening, but you have to just keep on the train. That's how people see love. And so it's very, it, it's easy to read. It's hard to, you know, apply in your life is what I was getting at. So then he comes up with this principle that that's really making the whole idea hidden in their mind to answer your question, Phil. Because then he says this, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. So you almost have to stop and say, do what now? I mean, because that does not make any sense at, at first hearing. If you want to save your life. In the physical, you're in the physical world, that statement would make no sense. If you didn't have a spiritual component. Lose. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Hang on, Jess. Let's take another break. But what's interesting now is you're right. We immediately go spiritual, but but as far as himself, he was thinking physical also. He's literally going to save our lives by losing his. The, it, it's, it's the combination of what he just predicted with us responding to it. So then he says, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. So in a way, he's saying, because I'm going to die and I'm going to be buried and I'm going to be raised, you should lose your life. You should say, "I'm now I, I do think that's a spiritual application for us. And that's what happens when we hear the gospel. And really, when you tie in this to all the illustrations of, you know, baptism being a surrender and a reenactment of his death, burial, and resurrection, it gets quite powerful when you, when you start thinking about what yeah. he's implicating here, spiritually speaking. So what good is it for a man to gain the whole world? Now, now th here he makes a transition into the difference in kingdoms here, because every other kingdom is about the king surviving no matter what. So he's letting everyone else lose their life for him. He's the last man to go. And so you see that even in the, uh, you know, different, I think about that uh, story in Daniel that I've referenced before, but, you know, when Daniel made the prediction about the Son of Man would come, come one day and, and establish a kingdom that would never be destroyed and crush all other kingdoms, and it's like two chapters later, there's this weird story about the king where the writing of the wall happened because they were surrounded, they were fixed to be destroyed, and they're all in there drinking wine out of out of gold goblets and because they could not deal with the fact of living without all this stuff. So they just have one more, one more party and you know, God has a writing on the wall. You're done. And that was the gist of what he said. And that King was dead before the sun came up. And so he makes this analogy here. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and lose or forfeit his very self? That there's the answer to the question, it's not good. You could be the most powerful king, material possession wise, the world has ever known, but you can't fix your sin and you can't live again. If someone comes along and so if anyone is and this is really uh uh the name of our podcast, this is one of the references why we name this podcast Unashamed, because in this key moment of Luke. Because don't ever doubt it. This is a key moment. Who Jesus is, Peter declaring it, Jesus' prediction, and what that means to those who follow him. He says, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him 
when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. I tell you the truth. Now, here is another lightning rod statement. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. So you're going to see the king come. You're going to see the king die, be raised, and you're going to see people repeating that process in their own lives from a spiritual standpoint. And you're going to see that happen in your lifetime. Eternal life is possible. It's I'm, possible. I'm going to make it that way. So that's the prediction midway through Luke. Excellent, so uh, there's a lot, a lot of stuff in there. Uh, let, let me just add a couple of things. One is whenever Peter makes his confession, and this is to me very encouraging for us, and especially think about the first time you confess Jesus as Lord. You know, you can make a true statement and a submissive statement and not understand everything. I mean, that's evident, right? We know Peter didn't know what he would know later fully, even in that moment. But that's heartening to me that when we confess Jesus as Lord, that we're saying we trust you even though we don't get it all in the moment. In other words, you spend, Peter spent the rest of his life yeah. learning what that meant. So one guy that I was reading compared it to uh, Einstein's mass energy equation, E equals MC squared. He said, you know, I know that's true because it's the basis of nuclear and atom fission and, and everything we know about it is true. But I, don't ask me to explain it because I'm not Einstein. But I know that yeah. it's true. And I think the same thing with Jesus. You know, we, we can't in the moment, Peter couldn't explain everything that was going to happen. But he knew that Jesus was the one who he said he was. And that's what got well, the ball rolling for. Him. Well, I got news for you. We don't understand the things that happen even to this day to go back to Phil's original question. We don't understand God's plan for our life, just like they didn't understand God's plan for their life. You're like, well, yeah, but we understand the gospel. Yeah. But we still have to deal with all the uncertain things that happen that doesn't make sense to us. We're like, well, I'm out here sharing Jesus and you know, my wife left me or whatever illustration you want to put in there, but bad things happen. They continue to happen. We don't have God's view in that he is not living moment by moment, and we are. So evil, there's always... been conquered, but he's still there. Exactly. There, there's always going to be doubts, and there's always going to be uncertainty as this moves along. But God has given us the path to victory in that he will always be with us. We're going to go through this together, and it may not end well from an earthly standpoint, but it's always going to end well from a spiritual and a heavenly one because because we win. Guys, yeah. All these guys that it was handed to and explained to, all of them died pretty tough deaths. They did. And we may as well in the name of Jesus, but... Well, and that's, that's a great yeah. point, Jesse. You, you, you mentioned it. Uh, let's take our last break. Jess, you mentioned it that... It, there is spiritual application to everything we see in this text, but you can't just shift it over to the spiritual because the physical does matter. Jesus is talking to men, uh, 12 of them. One of them, of course, is going to turn is become a traitor. But out of the other 11, 10 of them are going to give their lives just like Jesus did physically for the cause. I mean, so literally they're going to do what he said, deny themselves take up the cross, and they're going to give their lives. That's open for any of us who are believers. I mean, you know, right now we've been living in a pretty good era of time where, you know, you're, you're not killed for your faith in where we particularly live. Although people in other parts of the world, they are. You go to certain parts of Africa, even to this day, if you're a Christian living in a certain place, you may lose your life because of what you believe. And so there is a physical component here, but then obviously the overriding is that we all this happens because we follow his example, which I think was his point. I'm doing this so you won't have to, because our death, even though it honors Christ, it's not going to save anybody else. But his death saved all of us, and that was the one that mattered. Well, and that's why when you get to the next thing that happens, this this is the culmination 
of where since we now un, are understanding that Jesus is going to die, you know, Jesus he goes and has a he's just talking to God, you know, on a mountain. Eight eight days later, he took Peter, John, and James, and they went up on a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. And so before we get to who shows up, because, you know, we're in our last segment here, I think now there was a couple things happening. He's more than a prophet because now he has introduced what he's going to do, the plan to his disciples. So he is prophesying that, but he's also praying because once he stated that to his disciples, well, that became real. And the reason I read the Luke 12 about when he said, I have a baptism to undergo and I'm distressed about it. Well, it was difficult for Jesus to die. I mean, you're talking about humility. And, and we see that in his in his heart when he's when he's asking the Lord in the garden, you know, is there any other way? And we see that when he says, cries out, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, it, his human side of experiencing death, and this is humility times a thousand. But here you see, I, I'm pretty sure that he was praying about this. And what happens? We, we now get an image. The imagery of this transfiguration is incredible. You know, the cloud comes in. He's glowing. The, the Father's speaking. And it takes you back to what happened at Mount Sinai. And when the law came out, you know, you had the cloud, the presence of God. And they had this system set up where if anybody, I think it's in uh, Exodus 33, you read about it, but... You know, no one could see the face of God. Why? He said, you'll, you'll die. I, I'm too powerful. So now you have a transition in history where instead of the glory coming down, it's actually coming out from Jesus. And we, we know why, because, you know, Hebrews 1, God is now speaking to us through Jesus. And I think this is a key moment here. I mean, I think it happened as a result of showing his disciples that he's more than a prophet. He is a prophet, but he's more than that. You know who he is. He, he's the son of God. But it's also this fulfillment of what happened in Israel and what it means to Exodus captivity, have an Exodus where you go from captivity to freedom, but this is more the ultimate freedom from sin and death. And it, it's a preview that happens. And what I think is significant was unlike what happened in the Old Testament, whether if you saw the face of God, you would die, they could actually see it, which is what Jesus really is all about. Him coming down so human beings could experience what God is like. They can out, because they didn't die. You know, you're waiting for them to look at him and say, oh, but that's it, incineration, you know, whatever reason. But now that he's become a human, we can have that bridge to who God is. That's why this is a really key moment in Luke, I think. Yep. And what's interesting, Jay, is the word there that describes this change, the Greek word there is metamorpho, which, of course, we recognize it's the English word translated out of that is metamorphosis. In other words, this is something that now we see as a transition that's available for someone else. So the idea is there was a metamorphosis in Jesus to show this glory. You're right in a way now that can be grasped. And so some people have said, uh, and because we didn't talk about this, you mentioned in, in verse 27 when he said, uh, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God, that this was the first glimpse of the kingdom of God was in this moment, these three disciples. And some people think that's what he meant there. I don't. I think he's talking about the coming of the church and, you know, the Holy Spirit coming well, and all right. that. But, I agree with you, but I do think it's a part of it, you know, because the part of is. coming in the kingdom is actually grasping the very idea of this. <laughs> exactly. So this <laughs> I mean, is a this glimpse. Which is why I brought up on the last podcast that you would think the disciples would get it. But look, the reason they didn't get it is the same reason we don't get it 
it, when things come up in life, we are bound by our physical bodies and we think like humans and we, we don't understand. We think, well, if I follow God, I shouldn't have any problems. I mean, you'll say that's not true, but when something happens to you, you get a diagnosis for cancer or your kid does or whatever. I mean, we just immediately think, well, I don't understand this. What I thought. And, and so that frame of mind is what happens. And you see it happen in the disciples life. We don't go two paragraphs and some people don't like their message and they're James and John are wanting to rain down fireballs on them. That's right. <laughs> What happened to this lose your life and all, you know, we're, I, we're going to give up our lives, guys. And look, I have the power. Trust me. You saw Moses and Elijah. So let's just stick to the plan. Two paragraphs later, let's do some fireball hurling. That They couldn't get past that Elijah was standing up there. And no, this is not the plan because then you've missed the character involved that it takes to display this, which is coming from God which is going to get into the love and patience and endurance and all the things we have to do. It, nothing has changed. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're, you're not going to have to be patient and loving and forgiving and understanding and have people persecute you. That's why he said, if you want to come follow me, bring your cross. I mean, when he said, bring your cross, that, that's where people should really have to sit up on the edge of their seat and realize, do you want to follow him or not? Because the cross comes with it. Your cross, which means every day you're going to have to walk down that road, carrying your cross with people persecuting you, doing you wrong, insulting you, making up stories against you, whatever. They don't want to forgive you. I mean, there's just going to be a list a mile long, which is why we have so much trouble getting along, you know, with, with human beings. And that's one of the reasons why he said you have to die daily is it's something we have to think about every single day. You carry that cross uh, and it's, it's a daily thing. It doesn't just, it's not a one time I mean, fits all type situation. All right. We're out of time. Uh, but obviously we're still dealing with some of this stuff from the transfiguration that fits into it to Jace's point. It shows you how big the moment is here in our text. So in our overtime segment, we'll talk a little bit more about that. If you want to follow us over blaze tv.com slash unashamed is how you get our overtime. Thanks for listening to the unashamed podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes and don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.